Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 41 Jolly Blackburn and Kenzer and Company. Yeah, all right, so I know I'm doing another Artist and Company deep dive not too long after I did the last one, but I realized I've been talking a lot about games and dice, and I've been neglecting the individuals who've brought us all of this awesome stuff over the years. So this week, we talk about an individual who has brought smiles to the faces of tons of readers over the past couple of decades, one Jolly Blackburn. Jolly Randall Blackburn, by the way, I just find it really cool his name is actually Jolly, that that's not just a nickname. Sorry, I I fanboyed. Let me try that again. Jolly Blackburn doesn't talk much about when and where he was born or about his early life, either in interviews or on social media, and quite honestly, I'm okay with that. I've said this before, and I'll say it a hundred times more probably, just because you've made it in the publishing or gaming world doesn't mean everybody needs to know everything about you. So, for our purposes, let's just say the gods decided the world needed an exceptionally talented son of a gun to create products that would entertain gamers for more than three decades. Sound good? Well, that's what I'm going with, so I, I hope it did. Where all of the biographies of Jolly pick up is with his attendance at Ball State University, where he majored in anthropology, history, and classical studies. And I'm just going to add this. If that selection of majors doesn't lead to you being one hell of a gamer, I don't know what will. After college, Jolly joined the U.S. Army and faithfully served his country for a number of years. Again, his service time isn't something he gets into great detail about, but what we do know is that he was a sergeant during Operation Desert Storm, and one of the things he did during that time was to activate reservists for remedial training prior to deployment. Now, for the record, the mention of Jolly's army rank comes from Shannon Applecline's 2011 book, Designers and Dragons. The mention of what he did is something I actually noticed on Wikipedia, but we all know about Wikipedia, and I'll note there wasn't a source cited, so even though I am going with it, I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong about that, then I do apologize. The thing with Jolly is that his service time is not something he really gets out there and brags about, and quite frankly, that just makes him that much cooler to me. Oh, and I do need to take a second to thank Jolly and all of those who are or who have served their country faithfully in the armed forces. And yes, I don't just mean in the United States, because I know we've got followers all over the globe. However, Jolly didn't just serve his country. While he was enlisted, Jolly started his own company, Alderac Entertainment Group, and started publishing his own gaming magazine, Shadas. Now, I'm calling it Shadas. If I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize now, but it's going to be the same pronunciation throughout. Shadas started first. Now, according to multiple sources, Shadas was originally intended to be an independent fanzine when it was created in 1990. If you're curious as to what exactly a fanzine is, well, a fanzine is a magazine typically created and written by fans of something. In the case of Shadis, Jolly's a tabletop role player, so Shadis was intended to celebrate the fandom of gaming. Shadis was, in its original form, a black and white digest style magazine that contained gaming articles, mostly written by Jolly himself, and each issue also had fiction pieces in it called the Alderac and Thalal. Each issue also had fiction pieces in it called the Alderac Anthology, which gave Jolly the opportunity to detail his game setting of Alderac. But Wayne, I can hear you say, you're always talking about Knights of the Dinner Table. When are we getting to that? Patience, my Padawan. We're getting there. In fact, we're there. Knights of the Dinner Table first appeared as a comic strip in Shadis Magazine in 1990. Now... Jolly has admitted over the years, both in published interviews and comments at conventions, he really never intended to publish his own comic. In an interview conducted for Dragon Magazine by Alan Varney in 1998, Jolly said, I'd been a great fan of J.D. Webster's Phineas Fingers from the early Dragon Magazine, and I wanted something similar. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anyone willing to do a strip. 
Finally, I sat down and drew out a very crude cartoon showing a game master and a player sitting around a table arguing over a rules call. That comic was Knights at the Dinner Table. Oh, and for the record, Phineas Fingers also appeared in the pages of Shadows over the years, so Jolly ultimately got not just something similar, but exactly what he wanted. Getting back to the creation of Knights at the Dinner Table for a moment. Fans of the comic have known for a long while that Jolly didn't intend KODT to be a permanent strip. In fact, in multiple interviews, Jolly has stated that his goal was for the strip to be short of a placeholder until he could get what he deemed to be a better strip. In the meantime, however, KODT became a hit with Shada's readers. So much so that when Jolly decided to leave the strip out of an issue, the backlash he got caused him to put the strip right back in immediately. So, Shadis was successful, Knights of the Dinner Table was successful, what could possibly go wrong? Well, during Jolly's military service time, Shadis was shuttered for about a year and a half. That I could find, Jolly's never really gotten into the why behind it. But it's safe to assume that his military duties prevented him from giving Shadis the time and attention it needed, and rather than put out a subpar product, he shut it down. That might be the story, it might not be the story, but it's the story that I'm going with because it seems to make sense. Shadis returned to print in 1992 and Knights of the Dinner Table continued to be a part of it. Now, I've already done a profile of Knights of the Dinner Table back in episode 21, which covered role-playing game comics, so we won't be getting too deep into that today. But I have said it before, and I will say it again. I consider Knights of the Dinner Table to be one of four essential comics for all gamers to read, along with Dork Tower, Nodwick, and Order of the Stick. You are, of course, welcome to disagree with me, but if you do, you need to at me the comics you'd put on this list. In 1993, Jolly formed Alderac Entertainment Group, whose sole duty was to publish Shadis. The idea was for Shadis to become bigger or in this case, become what's been termed a quality small press magazine. Or at least that's what writers like Alan Varney have reported. Jolly brought on John Zisner and David Say as his partners, and it should be noted that the printing of the first three issues of Shadis under the Alderac banner were paid for by Jolly's friend, Frank Van Hoos. If the last name sounds familiar, it should. One of the main characters of KODT is named Brian Van Hoos, which I'm sure was borrowed from Frank, as Jolly has stated over the years that there are a number of real-world people who've inspired characters. Some inspire names, others inspire attitude. In late 1994, the crew at Alderac tried a promotion that led to a huge success. For one issue of Shadas, each copy of the magazine came with a random Magic the Gathering card in it. Why would that be a big deal? So, this was late 1994. Magic was a fairly new collectible card game, and booster packs for the game were really hard to find. So a magazine with Magic cards in it was going to get scooped up as quickly as people could find it. And they did, and it sold really, really well. According to reports, the promotion also led to more regular readers of Shadows, which was, of course, the idea in the first place. Out of all of those cards in the magazines, the goal was to get some folks who would obviously keep reading the magazine. Knights of the Dinner Table was really starting to come into its own around this time, and Alderac published three issues of a KODT comic book between 1994 and 1995. In that same Dragon Magazine article I referenced earlier, Jolly admitted that I soon became aware that the demand for KODT was much higher than I had ever realized. That got me thinking about doing it on a monthly schedule. 1994 also saw Shadis be awarded the Origins Award for Best Professional Gaming Magazine. It would repeat these honors in 1995 and 1996. However, Jolly wouldn't be at Alderac to collect the 1996 honors as he chose to leave the company he created in 1995. The stated reason for his departure is a familiar one in the business world. Jolly had one vision for the company while his partners had a different one. In her piece on Jolly, Shannon Applecline noted that Jolly's goals for Alderac were to keep the company small and fun, the focus on Knights of the Dinner Table and Shadis, while John Zinzer and David Say wanted to get into the collectible card game industry and make a splash. 
For the record, Zinzer and Say would be successful in that endeavor, but a deeper dive into Alderac Publishing is another episode. Jolly left the company with the rights to the Knights of the Dinner Table, as well as a few other creations of his, but Shadis wasn't one of them. Shadis Magazine would continue to be published by Alderac until 1998, when it went on hiatus. That hiatus is apparently permanent since it hasn't published an issue since. Oh, and since we're probably not going to do a Shadis Deep Dive episode, let's drop in a review of the magazine from the August 1994 issue of Dragon. Lester Smith wrote that a truly independent publication, it covers a wide range of topics in the gaming hobby and always entertains. Jolly Blackburn kept on keeping on, putting together another company, KODT Interactive Factory, which he used to publish Knights of the Dinner Table as a monthly comic book. However, Jolly would only be out on his own for about a year because in December of 1996, he joined the company that he's still a big part of today, Kenzer and Company. When asked about what drew him to Kenzer, Jolly told Alan Varney that over the years, he'd met and become friends with several employees at Kenzer, and we discovered we had so much in common, I decided to come aboard and throw my intellectual properties in the kitty. Jolly did so much more than that. He became a vice president of the company and continues to hold that title today. Kenzer and Company began publishing the KODT comic book monthly with the reprint of issue number four. For the record, issue number 290 is currently available, so the comic has some serious staying power. KODT also moved to Dragon Magazine as a strip with issue number 226, which released in February of 1996. Now, Jolly's done a lot more than just that for Kenzer and Company over the years, but since we're going to talk about the company in a couple minutes, we'll hold off. Since we've mined the Alan Varney article for quotes today, I wanted to get one more in here. Jolly said the following to Varney about Knights of the Dinner Table. Over the years, I've often wondered just what it is that causes all the fuss. I'm the first to look at the typical strip and say, it's not all that. Well, Jolly, for fans of Knights at the Dinner Table, it is all that. KODT is, in my opinion, a very real look at gaming tables all around the world. Yes, it's a comic strip, and yes, the various characters take things to extremes that normal people wouldn't. But anybody who has ever GM'd for any length of time has probably empathized with B.A. Felton. I mean, the dude just can't win. Hell, I'd argue most of us have had at least one of the nights at our gaming table for a length of time. So if I were to sum up what all the fuss is, it's that it mirrors real for so many of us and then pokes fun at it. As I just noted, Jolly Blackburn continues to produce Knights of the Dinner Table comics monthly, as well as other products for Kenzer and Company. He is also a frequent attendee at conventions around the country. When I tweeted that I was talking about Jolly for today's show, I asked folks to send in any experiences or thoughts. To an individual, every comment I got was a variation on the same theme. Jolly's a genuine guy who enjoys interacting with the fans, and I, I can't find anybody who has anything bad to say about him. For the record, I follow Jolly on my personal Facebook account and on the Twitter account for the Role Playing History Podcast, and based on everything I've seen on both of those places, I've got to agree with folks on that. So thank you, Jolly, for being the inspiration for this podcast and for so many game ideas I've cribbed from Knights of the Dinner Table over the years. Next up on our tour today is the company I've mentioned several times already during today's show, Kenzer & Company. Kenzer & Company was established by David Kenzer in 1993. The company is headquartered in Waukegan, Illinois, which, for the uninitiated, is 26 miles north of Chicago's north side and is located on the shores of Lake Michigan. The first major product Kenzer & Company was known for was the 1994 release, Kingdoms of Calamar. Kingdoms of Calamar is a campaign setting for AD&D. However, it should be noted that Kenzer didn't have a license or permission to utilize AD&D stuff for a game system. So how does one get around that? David Kenzer, who is one of the credited designers, along with Brian Jelke and Steve Johansson, did it this way. The way Kingdoms of Calamar is printed and presented, it is obvious that it's supposed to be used with AD&D. 
However, in order to get around trademarks and copyrights, the guys made it a point to avoid using things that could be directly tied back to AD&D. Now, it's been pointed out by a number of reviewers that some AD&D stuff made it into the book, but it was obviously not enough to draw TSR's attention because there was never a lawsuit filed. Now, historically, this was neither the most popular AD&D or Kenzer & Company product, as it wasn't widely distributed and it wasn't a top seller. However, those who are fans of it, oh, they are rabid about it. Now, as I'm recording this, I don't have my own copy handy, because, yes, I bought one several years ago from a friend who was selling his AD&D stuff. But as I remember, it's a really rich setting with a lot of great detail. And frankly, Kingdoms of Calamar set a standard for quality that Kenzer and company continues to insist upon and maintain today. Kingdoms of Calamar got a third edition release for D&D, and this was official since it followed the open game license. There was also a fourth edition release, but it was unofficial since it didn't follow the game system license. However, since David Kenzer's pretty savvy about copyrights and trademarks, Kenzer and company once again stayed out of the legal soup. Kingdoms of Calamar is also the official setting for the second edition of Hackmaster. What's a Hackmaster, you might ask? We'll get to that in a minute. First, we have to bring Jolly Blackburn into the company, which, as you remember me saying just a couple of minutes ago, happened in December of 1996. He brought Knights of the Dinner Table with him, and that's where the Hackmaster connection comes in. See, Hackmaster is the D&D analog that the Knights play. Jolly wasn't a fool. When he created the strip, he was also trying to avoid issues with TSR concerning their intellectual properties. And since he knew he'd be poking fun at games and gamers, he created his own game for the Knights to play. Now, I remember that in the late 1990s, there were rumblings coming from fans who actually wanted to see a version of Hackmaster get published. However, since the game was presented as more of a parody in the strip, I was one of those who was concerned about how the game would play if it was actually created. Plus, as we've mentioned a dozen times before on episodes of this podcast, TSR was serious about protecting their intellectual property, so there would also be the issues of legality if it came out. Then, Wizards of the Coast accidentally stepped in it. As you might recall from one of our previous episodes, in 1999, Wizards put out a CD package called the Dragon Magazine Archive. As you might also remember, it caused issues because Wizards didn't get permission from everyone who'd had their works published in the magazine over the years, and this ultimately led to the CD being pulled. Well, it turns out, Knights of the Dinner Table was one of the published works they didn't get permission for. Kenzer and company saw their opening, settling their dispute with Wizards with an agreement for Kenzer Co. to publish Hackmaster for real. With that, 4th edition Hackmaster came out in 2001. This version was, much like its comic counterpart, a parody of D&D and other fantasy games. Two other editions have been released, Basic in 2009 and 5th edition in 2011. 5th edition, by the way, mostly did away with the parody concept and cleaned up material that would tie it to D&D, which meant the mechanics of the game had to be reworked a little bit for that release. We'll do a deeper dive into the games of Kenzer and company on another show, and I'll detail those changes for you then. A great many other works from the pages of Knights at the Dinner Table have seen the light over the years. Aces and Eights, which is the Western-style game played by the Knights, has been released in multiple editions over the years, and for the record, is a really cool game to play. I'm just a Deadlands guy, so... Sorry, guys. Fairy Meat, which was originally a parody advertisement in one of the KODT comics, then referred to as a game in another issue, has been officially released as a miniatures game. Kenzer & Company has also released board games and card games, most notably a card game based on Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah, these guys are just as cool as it sounds. Of course, Knights of the Dinner Table is still one of the premier publications for the company, and it's been joined by Knights of the Dinner Table Illustrated, which is a comic book that takes the adventures that the comic KODT gamers play and draws them out like their actual adventures with the characters that the characters play actually getting their own comic counterparts. You just you need to see it to believe it, and it is definitely some really, really cool stuff. 
Of course, we can't talk about Kenzer and company without shouting out some of the notable employees of the company. And if I'm mispronouncing names, guys, I do apologize. Pronunciations, for whatever reason, seem to get me on this show every time. Now, we've mentioned David Kenzer already, and his official title is President, but he is also one of the game designers. Brian Jelke, Steve Johansson, I've also mentioned them. There's vice presidents of the companies, and they are designers as well. Jolly Blackburn kicked off today's episode, and I mentioned in his deep dive that he is also a company vice president, as well as the creator and writer for Knights of the Dinner Table. Now, I should have mentioned Barbara Blackburn when I was talking about Jolly, because he shouts her out whenever he can and mentions how important she is to him. So I shall take 20 lashes with the wet noodle for that, Jolly and Barbara. Sorry. Barbara is officially the assistant editor of Knights at the Dinner Table, but she is also a writer on a number of Kenzer products, as well as being Jolly's number one fan and supporter. And according to many who reached out to me on Twitter, one hell of a nice person. So there you go. Jennifer Kenzer is the CFO of the company. And last but not least, Mark Plemons is what I would call a do-it-all kind of guy. He's a game designer, art director, convention manager, and according to all the sources I checked, a guy who will do just about any job that needs doing if somebody else doesn't beat him to it. And by the way, that's true of everybody who works for Kenzer & Company. Over the past few days, I've read stories and tweets from folks who've run into various Kenzer Co. employees over the years, and they all say the same things. Everybody's really cool to hang out with. They all seem to just do what needs to be done without a lot of discussion or arguing. And everybody who's ever had a chance to game with them talks about how absolutely awesome that they are. I just wish Waukegan wasn't like six hours away from where I'm based. Maybe a St. Louis area based office, guys? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Bob's your uncle. And it should be noted that Kenzer and company, jolly included, hit as many conventions as they can each year. Sure, they have the Kenzer and company tables there, and Jolly gets his KODT tables and flair and swag out there, but they also make it a point to be at the convention. They wander the halls with the rest of the attendees and chat up the other folks that are there. I also know from friends who've been at conventions these guys have been at that they play games, they run games, and they generally act like the rest of us when we're there. Folks are just so damned happy to be around our hobby that we have a permanent smile plastered on our faces. And for me, that's worth promoting on this show. By the way, if you want to check out any of the Kenzer and company products I've discussed on the show today, I would first suggest your friendly local neighborhood game store, as would the folks at Kenzer and company, for the record. However, if you don't have a friendly local neighborhood game store, check out their website at kenzerco.com. That's K-E-N-Z-E-R-C-O dot com. And with that, we come to the end of today's tour. Now, before I do anything else today, I wanted to take a second to go way off my normal topic because as this show drops, our world is anything but normal. I know we've got listeners all over the world, especially in the Ukraine, and I wanted to take a moment to send my thoughts to those folks who find themselves literally fighting for their freedoms and their lives. For those of you who think freedom is just something you're given, I want you to think again. I'm almost 49 years old, so I've lived through a portion of the Cold War, and that's something I'd kind of like to avoid doing again. Though, if we're being honest, the current political climate might not allow for it. If you're looking for ways to support the Ukraine other than thoughts and prayers, you can check your preferred social media apps, as well as pretty much everywhere online. There are numerous legit sites out there that connect you with organizations that are providing relief and assistance to those in need. All right, next week we're going to do a really deep dive as we get into the second edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Now, I know I've mentioned this particular subject the past couple of weeks, but I really want to see this guy's Kickstarter succeed, so I want to plug it again. Freelancer's Guide, which is a deck-building role-playing game system, is live on Kickstarter as we speak. I know I don't usually get into card games, but this one really looks cool. So much so that I've pledged into the game myself, which I have to admit I don't often do. It is billed as a mix of Ocean's Eleven and Now You See Me, with hints of Cowboy Bebop and Firefly. In it, you are living in a time when megacores rule the world, which kind of gives it a shadow run feel. You and your crew have to figure out how to navigate the system and probably rip off the system, which has its own inherent dangers. 
They've got a variety of tiers depending on your preferences, so check them out on Kickstarter. That's Freelancer's Guide from Pagoda Games. As usual, I have to give a huge shout out to you for hanging with us to this point. The kind words you're sending along really do help encourage me to keep on keeping on, and I've promised more than once that as long as you keep listening, I'll keep cranking out episodes. You can follow us on Facebook, Role Playing History Podcast, Twitter at Role Playing P, our YouTube channel, Role Playing History Podcast. You, you, you know what to do when you get there. No need for me to repeat it. You can also send us email, roleplayinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. Next week, we dig into the vastness that is second edition AD&D. Get ready for a long episode, kids, because it's coming. I better take my ADD meds for that one. Just saying. But anyway, that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, and you're role-playing history.